This is episode 72. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Sears. On this show, you're going to discover strategies, tips, and secrets for running a fun, flexible, and profitable architecture practice. So thanks for joining us today. It is great to have you here. Now, to get access to training webinars and other insider-only resources, go over to Business of Architecture and join our insiders list. You'll also want to sign up for the early notification list for the Business of Architecture conference. This is going to be the event this year for solo and small firm architects that want to run a more flexible and profitable firm and have fun doing it. We've got a great lineup of speakers, but only those on the list will get first notice with all the deets. So head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the list. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. So I just want to thank them for their generous support of the show. For over 10 years, Archie Office has been helping architects run firms that are more flexible, fun, and profitable. So thank you, Archie Office, for empowering business of architecture, and we're glad for all you're doing out there to help architects run a more successful business. Check it out at archieoffice.com. Today's guest is Daniel Willis. Daniel Willis is the author of The Emerald City and other essays on the architectural imagination. He's a professor at Penn State University. Professor Dan Willis, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. You came out with a book, The Emerald City, in uh, around 1999. Uh, and tell us a little bit about this, and then we're going to talk a little bit about your strategies for making architecture with relate to how architects can create architecture and some of the different strategies that architects are doing both to market their firm and to do the kind of projects they want to do. So can you just give me a little background of the book and the process and uh, how that how that's this essay came about. Okay. Well, uh, I think I wrote most of the book in 1998. I, uh, since I'm a full time academic, I had a sabbatical year and I spent a year trying to take a bunch of sort of threads or strands of things that I was interested in and sort of figure out how they might go together. And uh, I had never written a book before, so it was difficult for me to do that. And I had a good piece of advice from someone who said, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be one chapter leads to another. It could just be a collection of essays. And that saved me a lot of angst and, and worry because I, I, I wasn't really sure as I was writing how all of it would come together. And so I sort of hit on this essay form and I would take uh, something of which I had interest and sort of spin out an essay. Uh, but the one that uh, you refer to, which was called seven strategies for, for making architecture. Um, it's somewhat, it's sort of a critique of industrialization and the sort of industrialization of architecture so most architects probably don't really think about the industrial revolution or the sort of industrial mindset and how it affects what they do. Uh, but what I identified in this book and in other things I've written is sort of the ongoing effects of uh, industrialization on architectural practice and the production of buildings. And in some ways, this is a sort of critique of that because uh, I think I was looking for ways that maybe were more akin to the, the, the sort of longstanding tradition of the architect as a craftsperson or as an artist, uh, and still realizing that, that the people that practiced architecture had to make a living at it and had to be uh, at least to some degree successful in business. Uh, so it was, a, I think, in a way, a kind of... Uh, oddball way of looking at it. Uh, but I, I still wanted to be practical. I wanted them to be realistic suggestions, uh, even though they're uh, probably a little bit whimsical and they're not the sort of thing you would read in, in uh, you know, business week or <laughs> some, uh, some uh, article suggesting how architects can make more money. Well, can you um, provide, so you talked about industrialization with regard to architecture. Can you define that for me? Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, it, it would probably be 
the key word in the definition would be efficiency. So it would be the quest to make architectural practice more efficient. And just like uh, the industrial uh, industrialization of almost anything of the production of automobiles was, uh, you know, or textiles was a, uh, a set of practices that, that made that operation more efficient. So uh, I'm, I'm a kind of crit critic of efficiency. I, I, I realize that it has great value in some instances, but I also think it's tremendously overvalued in our society, uh, in part because it's relatively easy to measure. And we tend to overemphasize those things that we can easily quantify. And we have a difficult time uh, value, putting enough value on things that are difficult to quantify. So it's, it's relatively easy for an architecture firm to, you know, figure out, uh, you know, their uh, profitability uh, and, and whether they've uh, succeeded in making a profit on a project. It's a lot harder for them to quantify the, the value of the building that they designed as architecture or to say, you know, this is a this is a masterpiece or this is a mediocre building or this is a failure of a building. So that's a lot harder to quantify. Um, but I think, um, yeah, so so in a way, my uh, my strategies all have this sort of skeptical uh, attitude toward efficiency, um, you know, the the. Frederick Taylor was the efficiency expert uh, and uh, was known for, you know, time and motion studies and applying that to industrial production. But to some degree, a lot of what you read about architectural practice today, uh, things about BIM and, uh, you know, in the 80s about, about CAD, uh, talk a lot about making the production of architectural designs more efficient. So there's a kind of lineage there that goes back to the kind of things Frederick Taylor was trying to do for uh, manufacturing. And in what ways do you feel that this quest for efficiency hurts architecture firms or the industry? Um, the one issue is uh, that architects really enjoy what they do, most of them anyway. Um, since I teach, you know, most of our students are uh, very much uh, in it for the love of designing and doing things creative. Um, so they're not yet at the stage where they're trying to earn a living. Um, but I think all architects uh, at least initially get into the field because they think that it will be challenging and creative and will fulfill their need to uh to make the world a better place and to create things. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that those attitudes and that sort of uh, reward that you get from, from doing the work of architecture is completely um, compatible with the quest for efficiency. I think there are some, some ways that you can have an efficient practice and still a, a very rewarding uh, work experience for the people. But um, it's often taken too far, I guess, uh, in, in our society. And so I think uh, people, um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a challenge for an architecture firm to um, make sure that everyone is well compensated, the firm's profitable, uh, and yet uh, everyone's very proud of the work they do and, uh, and, and derives a lot of personal pride and satisfaction from the work they do. I think, I think that's very challenging to, to get that mix right. Why do you think it's so challenging? Again, because I think there's a, there's a level of incompatibility. Um, I have a I borrowed from uh, the philosopher Hannah Arendt uh, the distinction between work and labor, uh, that most people use those words synonymously, but she was one of the first people to say they're two different things. And uh, I've refined her definitions a little bit, but basically um, labor is industrial production. It's, it's what Taylor was after. It, it values output and efficiency of output and uh, work, in my definition, is um, has other benefits. Uh, it, it may be very productive and it may be times at times efficient, but work uh, is its own reward. The people, so people that enjoy doing work, somebody 
uh, that has a, a garden outside their house and tends the garden. It's a lot of work for them to have a beautiful garden, but they d derive a lot of pleasure from it. So it's sort of hard to square that with some of our definitions. Uh, most of the time when we talk about work, uh, we talk about minimizing it. Uh, you know, we talk about like we want, we want to, uh, you know, we would like to work as few hours as possible so we have the maximum amount of leisure time. But it's interesting to see what people do with their time off. They often work very hard. They they have uh, something like a garden or they, you know, restore an old boat or they uh, have a classic car that they tinker with and take care of. So I guess, uh, you know, what I, what I find, I, I believe a lot of our sort of contemporary theories of, uh, you know, industrial psychology even are um, still, to me, kind of trapped in the, this sort of Taylorist uh, definition uh, and, and uh, sort of conceptual framework, uh, which I don't think is particularly uh, relevant uh, to, to, to a field like architecture that's creative. Uh, there's some other problems uh, that I've recently been tying to issues of sustainability too. I also don't think labor is sustainable. Uh, you, you become exhausted, you get bored with your job. So I think there's an inherent unsustainability about that type of production. Whereas people that really enjoy their work, um, people uh, often remark about how architects never retire and, and there are many architects working in their eighties. Uh, and I think that's a sign that, uh, you know, that, that architects really enjoy the, the work of, uh, of designing things and uh, don't see it as something that they should minimize or hurry up and finish so they can go home and watch television. So. <laughs> well, within, so, that, within that framework, Dan, let's talk about your strategy number one, which is collaboration and conviviality. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I subtitled that Take the Client to Lunch. Um, so it really came down to uh, sort of breaking down the barrier of a strictly business relationship with the client and actually developing, if not a friendship, uh, at least a kind of mutual appreciation. Um, so it was, um, and I, I think that this, that's somewhat inherent of what professionals have always aspired to do, that the, that the, the idea of a profession and practicing as a professional was uh, really a relationship built on trust with the client. So it was never strictly about making money or maximizing uh, profit. It was really kind of founded on this idea that, that you would win the trust of the client and the client would trust you to do, to offer very good advice or very good, uh, the best possible service. Uh, and so Basically, the strategy one somewhat restates that or, or, or you know, tries to revive that professional goal. Uh, but I also talk a little bit about collaboration with other people, like the contractors that build buildings. So, um, even, again, I wrote this in the late 90s, uh, but a lot of what I describe as a kind of uh, – you know, convivial working relationship between the builder, the contractor, and the architect is what uh, integrated project delivery is trying to do today. So that term, at least to me, I didn't know of it at that time. I don't think people were talking about integrated project delivery exactly in that term uh, in the late 90s. But in, in a way, that's sort of at least the goal that I was describing is shared uh, by IPD, whether I'm, I'm a little skeptical of the method, uh, I'm, but I, I do think that that is a worthwhile goal. Let's talk about the method there, because I do see a little bit of a dichotomy here, uh, Professor, with your talk about um, a certain critique of efficiency, and yet I know that IPD, one of the primary purposes behind that is to increase efficiency. Yeah, and I and I think that it should do that in in an ideal situation or uh, when it works well. Um, I guess uh, where I where I very much agree with the goals of IPD is uh, the collaborative working relationship between the parties. 
because I, I do believe a lot of uh, difficulty in the practice of architecture uh, has come from the somewhat adversarial relationships that can develop between the client and the architect and the architect and the builder. Um, and a lot of that uh, was the result of the sort of design bid, be- uh, bid and build uh, method. So I thought, you know, whenever the contractor was under pressure uh, and, and was in danger of losing money, uh, the, the working relationship usually went sour because they, they uh, you know, they were at great risk of, uh, of losing uh, large amounts of money. So the IPD, by sort of making everyone uh, a member of a, of a kind of business entity where they all share responsibility, they all have a common goal to, to build the building and to get it done uh, efficiently, um, I, I, I support those and I think those are, are worthy goals. Um, my, my only skepticism and I've never actually been on an IPD team. I've not done any projects that are done that way, but, um, I'm aware, uh, some of the projects of my university, Penn state have, have been done that way. And I, um, uh, no friends, architects who, who have, uh, worked on IPD, uh, projects. Um, I'm a little, concerned about the role of the architect on that collaborative team. Uh, If the architect is really seen as one specialist among many specialists. Uh, And, and that's, and some of the things I know some teams have done things like they've, they've uh, got the, the group of people in the integrated project team together and they'll give everybody a Myers-Briggs personality test and try to determine who, who's outspoken and who might be an introvert and who, you know, what sort of types of uh, personalities are in the room uh, in an attempt, I think, to put everyone on, a, on an even plane, a, a even playing field. But I'm, I, I'm a little worried about that. I, I, I think that, um, that the architect's role is really to be not to be a specialist among other specialists, not to be the design specialist. And I think the architect's role is to be the integrator. Uh, the, the, it's, it would be, you know, when people say that, um, you know, architects are the last generalists or they don't, it's, uh, I, I think, you know, kind of facetiously would say that, you know, architects should specialize in not specializing. And so what we should try to do is know enough about all the, various aspects of a building project that we can help the client make the sorts of intelligent trade-offs that need to be made between sort of competing, uh, competing goals. Because I think every complicated project you're faced with making trade-offs and difficult decisions. And it seems to me that that's the role the architect uh, is uniquely qualified to play. So, Again, without having actually gone through a project and been part of the process, I'm I'm looking from afar. But uh, I am I am somewhat concerned if the the players in an IPD process are all seen as sort of uh, specialists. And you know, when it's an issue of constructability, then the construction manager steps forward, and that's the specialist you talk to. Or if it's a, a an issue of uh, you know, the uh, electrical system, the building, the electrical engineer steps forward. But I think I would hope that the architects can somehow uh, retain a role of of the the person that understands it all and has a sort of global vision and can sort of make decisions between, um, you know, again, difficult trade-offs, I guess, is the the best way I can say it. so that's that's my only concern so far about the IPD process. But I, I endorse the goals. I think they're good goals. Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archeoffice.com. Now back to our show. Okay. Your second 
uh, strategy for making architecture here is respected professional and troping of limitations. <laughs> so uh, again, I think it's uh, similar to the first one in that I'm trying to uh, underline the status of the professional and that, and that, the, that this relationship of trust uh, be built up. Uh, and so uh, another thing that I'm a bit concerned about is this globalization of architectural practice. Uh, so in that chapter, uh, I believe I used uh, Faye Jones practice from Fayetteville, Arkansas, as mm -hmm. an example. Uh, on my Early on my sabbatical, I had gone to Fayetteville and I gave a lecture at the University of Arkansas, but I spent a day uh, basically at his office and met the people working there and, uh, you know, talked to everyone and sort of got a sense of their practice. And based on my memory, I think it was probably about eight people who worked in his office at that time. Uh, there was maybe, uh, he had his partner, Maurice Jennings, and there was a sort of senior project manager who was a guy probably in his mid forties. And then there were some younger people, some, some students from the university, um, but it was a very small practice and it was a very regional practice uh, until uh, very late in his career when he became sort of nationally and internationally known. It was it was very much a regional practice. And so the bonds that he was able to form with clients and with his community, um, I again, I'm I'm a little bit concerned uh with the sort of globalized practice if, if that gets lost. So I do think that there's still a value in uh, making connections to one's community. And, uh, you know, certainly there's a marketing component to that. Uh, but I also think there's just, uh, you know, it, it goes to that question of trust uh, and also that you get to know a place and you get to know what's appropriate uh, for that place. And I think it's hard to, hard to replace that kind of familiarity. Although I also recognize, um, the building that, that I'm in this office, uh, was designed by Overland partners from San Antonio. And it's a, uh, it's, it's a lead, uh, silver certified building. Uh, but, um, the architect, uh, them being in San Antonio and the building being in Pennsylvania, I thought that they had a very interesting take on that. And they said that, um, and they also worked with a, a, a more regional firm, a firm from Pittsburgh, uh, WTW. Uh, but they said that, you know, by not being from central Pennsylvania, it allowed them to see the place in a different way than perhaps an architect from this area could. So they, they thought it was important for them to try to understand the place, but also to know that they could, they could bring something new or they could sort of reframe it in a different way. Um, so I, I do think they were right. I, 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 I think that was an intelligent comment and I do think, um, it is possible for architects from to practice somewhere where they're not familiar with the area. So I don't, I don't want to go so far to say as everybody should practice in their hometown or where they live. Uh, but I do think I do still have a bit of a concern about the globalization of architecture and sort of the loss of, of place or the, 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 uh, you know, the specialness, the uniqueness of a place. And I thought Overland Partners was aware of that, and they did everything in their power to to, to try to, uh, uh, you know, sort of build that that awareness into their design practice, which uh, I, th I I respected a great deal when I heard them say that. Um, but so that so this strategy is really about you know trust and and maybe building relations with the community. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think what else I wrote because it's, um, yeah, it's just, uh, again, I think, you know, it's a way of trying to, uh, to relate to the client and to, uh, to break down any kind of barrier that might exist uh, between the architect and, the, and their clients and their community. So that was, that was number two, I think. Excellent. All right.
Now, your number three here, it's interesting, uh, unconventional practices, a subtitle, or the day job. Tell me about yeah. that one. Um, I think this one is mainly uh, an awareness that, um, that many of the practices, uh, many architect contemporary architectural practices, because of the pressure to succeed in business, um, must limit themselves. Maybe they limit themselves by doing a certain building type, or maybe they limit themselves by a certain sort of mode of practicing. Uh, may maybe uh, they get work primarily through large construction managers and contractors. So they sort of forge a relationship that way. But in any case, uh, when, when a practice does limit itself in a way uh, that makes economic sense or business sense for the firm, but perhaps leaves the employees a bit unfulfilled or, or risks uh, kind of a boredom setting in because things become too formulaic, um, then the possibility exists to do other kinds of projects, but maybe outside the structure of the day job or the, the, the main practice. So uh, the exa one example I mentioned in the book that came from some of our former students, uh, who many of our students work in the Philadelphia area, and some of them working in offices in Philadelphia would get together in the evenings and enter competition design competitions. So they would do that outside of their firm. Um, and the group that would get together, the team that would form to do the competition would be from various firms. So there was no, uh, there was no one firm that they represented. Um, and then as I was thinking about these things and, and, doing some research for my book, I came upon the Japanese firm Team Zoo. So I talk a little bit of that. That's basically how Team Zoo functioned uh, in Japan is that uh, it was uh, a group, a number of architects scattered at different places throughout Japan who enjoyed working together and looked for certain challenges where they could uh, pursue projects together. But uh, in initially outside of uh outside of the organization of their particular firms. And that evolved into a group of ateliers and they gave an animal name to each one. So they had a, an elephant and a monkey and a rhinoceros. So that's how it became Team Zoo. Uh, but they could practice independently or they could come together to make a larger firm to pursue a larger project. Uh, so that kind of uh, flexibility and and. Uh, not seeing that the the organizational structure of the practice, not seeing that as a as a kind of straitjacket that you can't get out of, but recognizing that you could step outside of that, uh, I thought was uh, uh, was a good strategy. And some firms, uh, I've also since found out that some firms encourage that uh, behavior. Um, AECOM, uh, the, the the Washington D.C. Uh, office of AECOM uh, has something called a young development group where they encourage the young architects to, to work on uh, design competitions sort of after hours and outside of the, uh, the, the main uh, daily operations of the firm, but they support them and they give them, uh, they give them help and resources, uh, which I, I think is really this strategy uh, being played out in a very large firm. So uh, I, I, I I still think that this one has some merit. <laughs> Interesting. And so the, let's move on to number four. Your fourth strategy here is imaginatively flawed and pro, uh, provocatively incomplete. Yeah, I think that one... Um... I'm, so, you know, when I'm looking back at this, uh, I'm not sure it's strictly a practice strategy it's almost more a design uh philosophy uh but i guess they do overlap to some degree um besides my um skepticism of uh, the industrialization of architectural practice and the overemphasis on efficiency uh i i'm also very uh ambivalent or, or skeptical uh, uh, about uh, a quest for perfection and completeness. So um, 
I think that those uh, tend to be uh, unrealistic goals and that they tend to sort of distort a project uh, in a way that's not typically uh, helpful. So uh, I tend to be a fan of uh, projects that are kind of inherently incomplete. Um, you know, the, it, I think, uh, again, I'll use an example that's close to home here. The, the benefactor for this building for our architecture school, um, a gentleman by the name of Cal Stuckman, when they were designing the building, he kept asking, uh, where is the addition going to go? And uh, the architects would kind of look at him and he's like, every building ends up having an addition uh, at some point in its life. And I want to know if you've thought of that. Uh, and, and I think that's very wise because I think buildings undergo lots of changes throughout their lives. And uh, oftentimes the architects uh, not only sort of pretend not to be aware of that, but sort of actively try to inhibit that. In other words, this is the perfect object and you can't change anything. Uh, but people do change uh, the building and the architect really has no control over or very little control. Uh, mm. So I, I, I'm sort of recommending an idea of, of an architecture that can adapt and can change. And I guess where that could be, uh, to some degree, a business strategy is that if you design buildings that can adapt and change, uh, and if you as the architect can perhaps have a continued role in that, in the life of the building, because uh, the client may come back to you and say, uh, okay, it's time to change this. And, you know, I, I understand that you've always sort of, you've, you've thought of that, you've thought that way. And, you know, tell us what the best way to make this uh, make this building adapt. Uh, so I guess I see it a bit as a business strategy, but it's also very much a kind of design philosophy for me that, that buildings are always incomplete. Uh, Stuart Brand has that book, How Buildings Learn, and he has a statement in there that, um, you know, a building is not something you finish, a building something you start. Uh, and I mentioned in the book, even in you know, our construction, AIA construction contracts, it's very difficult to say when the building is 100% complete. Um, and so really the important date is substantial completion when the owner can use the building for its intended purpose. But final completion can drag on. It can be that they just haven't submitted some some uh, manuals for how equipment in the building uh, works or they haven't completed some testing or something. So, um, so I think that's, that's true. Even if we look at our, our construction contracts that it's very difficult to say that a building's ever complete It's kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the story about the, the uh, golden gate bridge that they, you know, by the time they put a coat of paint on it, they have to start over and go back, you know, and repaint it. I'm not, I'm not sure that's true, but that's, that's kind of the, the urban legend. Uh, but I, th I think it's very misleading for architects to think of a building as something that you can finish. Well, I know that uh, definitely harkens back to my days in architecture school. <laughs> it was hard to finish then. Too. Never finished. Never finished. Well, Professor, we covered so far, we covered your first four strategies that were very uh, enlightening and thought provoking. I'd like to, we'll finish up the second three strategies in the second part of our interview. So okay. I want to thank you for joining us on the business of architecture. And first of all, just tell us where people can, you know, find out a little bit more about your work and, and uh, reach out to you if they have any additional comments or questions. Well, the the book that we're talking about, unfortunately, is out of print. It was uh, published by Princeton Architectural Press. But if you go to the Department of Architecture at Penn State University, the website, you can link uh, to me. And uh, I also have a much more recent book called uh, Architecture and Energy that's out. So I'm, I helped to I co was co-editor of that book, but that's published by Rutledge. And uh, we also have a website call, uh, called Architecture and Energy. So you can go to that website and find me. Excellent. Thanks for being on the show. Okay, thank you.
And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.